Okay, so now that we've done a deep dive into the open payments flows, I think it's important to take a moment to better understand these grant requests and the authorization protocols that lie behind them to see how they fit in and what their purpose is. So authorization protocols exist to give third parties access to your resources. For example, if you have uh, some kind of photo filter app and you want, or I don't know, a photograph organizer app or whatever, and you want that to have access to the photos that you have in your Google Photos album, all right? Then in order to, you don't obviously want Google to just be like, oh, sure, here we go. You can have access to Sarah's photos. Um, I'm sure you won't do anything malicious with them, right? So you, you would want Google to make sure that it first gets your consent for this third party application to access your photos. And so Google would send you a message saying something like, do you give this app permission to access these photos in this folder or whatever? And you would obviously need to be signed in in order to give that permission so that Google actually believes that it is talking to you and not just to any random. So authorization protocols would be something like OAuth for those of you who are familiar with that. What we use is Canap, which I will explain in the next slide. Uh, but the basic idea is that you need authentication. So users need to be logged in to make sure that they are who they say they are, right? That you are the person who's entitled to be giving these permissions. And then the authorization component is that a user will grant permission to a third party. And that permission is usually limited to specific resources. Um, so you know, an example of that would be, like I said, to apply a folder to a photo or to make a payment from my account. And then the, the service that you use to uh, authenticate yourself with, so that could be something like Google. In our scenario, that would be your authorization server. Once you have granted permission for this third party application to use your resources, the service will then provide them with an access token. And then lastly, the third party will take that access token and then be able to make a request directly to the resource server with that access token to show that it actually has the permission and authentication, sorry, and authorization <laughs> to make that request. So, um, you know, in the photo example, the resource server would be the Google Photos setup. Uh, for us, it would just be the resource server. Okay, so what is GNAP? GNAP stands for Grant Negotiation and Authorization Protocol. It's um, open payments basically specifies that um, we decided to use this authorization protocol in order to give those client applications authorization to use the open payments APIs so that they can interface with a customer's account. So basically this is the authorization protocol that we're using to allow uh, clients to have that direct access into their customer's accounts. Okay, and an authorization server needs to implement this CNAP standard in order to give clients those access tokens. And then clients will use those access tokens to send requests to the resource server on the customer's behalf. So before a client can access the open payments API, it must send a grant request to the authorization server. And this request must contain specific information like the types of resource it wants to work with, as well as the actions that it wants to take on those resources. So our resource types are the incoming payments, the quotes and outgoing payments. And those actions could be anything from getting that resource, creating a resource, deleting a resource, modifying a resource, okay. And then a successful grant request would result in the authentication server returning one or more access tokens to the client. What GNAP allows is for you to actually request multiple access tokens uh, with a single grant. So that can just sort of streamline things. And those access tokens represent a set of access rights or attributes to the client. 
So it's basically just representing the uh, authentication that they've been given from the user. Um, once the client has these access tokens, they can access the resource server and they can perform these authorized operations. So that means that they can now do things like create incoming payments on behalf of the customer. And once the client has sent a request along with their access token to the resource server, the resource server is able to check whether this access token is valid and hasn't just been, you know, uh, isn't like a forgery or some invention and it does that by actually making a call to the authorization server with that access token to say hey did you um you know did you provide this thing is it legitimate is it still valid has it been tampered with is it uh has it expired is it still active has it been revoked and it can get all of that information uh sort of directly from the horse's mouth So that would be an example of a non-interactive grant flow. And, you know, these uh, flows that we've just looked at don't require end user involvement. So that was the majority of the use cases in the open payments flow, except for when you're creating an outgoing payment. And the reason for this is you don't want to be kind of annoying users all the time to say, hey, can I make a quote? Hey, can I make an incoming payment? Because actually, like, just get on with the business of it, right? We don't want to be fussed all the time. So this non-interactive grant flows enables automated and secure access between services without user involvement. So then you might be asking, well, kind of what's the point then? If I'm not sitting here at the end of the day saying yes or no, you can or can't do these things on my account, why are you bothering to get these um, grants anyway, you know? And the reason is that they ensure that their only trusted services can obtain tokens and can access your resources. And we will get into why that is the case later, but the basic purpose behind non-interactive grants is to just make sure that you are actually speaking to trusted entities and not just to any random who is pretending to be someone that you would want uh, to send money to, for instance. So in an interactive grant flow, once the um, Once the client makes that grant request to the authorization server, the authorization server first says, well, I can't simply give you an access token. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to redirect you to the identity provider. And the identity provider will then make sure that the customer is who they say they are. They'll probably have some kind of login process for that and will then give the customer an option to consent to handing over this um, authorization to the client or not. And so they'll wait for the client to give consent or not, and we'll save that response and redirect back to the client. The client's then able to take that information and make a grant continuation request to the authorization server. So to say, okay, the client, uh, sorry, the customer did consent to this. Uh, can I please get that access token now? And at that point, the authorization server can then grant an access token to the client application. And of course, then same as before, the client can then use that access token to make its request to the resource server. So the basic flow that we have when a client is making a request to set up a payment. Um, so this is kind of bringing everything together is that they would first request an incoming payment grant from the receiver's authorization server. They would then send a request to create an incoming payment resource to the receiver's resource server. They would then request a quote grant from the sender's authorization server, send a request to create that quote resource on the sender's resource server, and then request an interactive outgoing payment grant for the sender's authentication server. And finally, send a request to actually create that outgoing payment and end the flow on 
the senders resource server. There is also a, a slight, um, a slightly different approach, which is that the client can, re can request a single interactive grant for both the quote and the outgoing payment from the uh, sender's auth authentication server, which means that they can kind of skip step five because they already have the appropriate access token to send the outgoing payment request immediately. So a grant indicates a transfer of authorization from a resource owner to a piece of software, which would be the client application. And the grant types need to match our resource type. So for us, we need a grant for incoming payments, for quotes and for outgoing payments. Grants serve as a request from the client to the authorization server. And once the grant is validated, it can be exchanged for access tokens. Usually grants are short-lived and in many cases also single use. Whereas access tokens are then issued by the authorization server. They're used by the client to access specific resources on the resource server. And a client will produce these access tokens to a resource server whenever they're making requests to access those protected resources. Access tokens can be short-lived, but they can also be long, longer-lived. So basically, successful grant requests result in access tokens. Access tokens ensure that authorized operations, sorry, that only authorized operations are executed, but we're still left with two very important questions here. So first, how do we know that we can trust that the client sending the request is who they say they are? And second, how can we be sure that the request hasn't been tampered with? So if you remembered when I spoke about non-interactive grants, I said that their main purpose was making sure that the client is someone that we can trust. So this is where I'm gonna answer that question. And the answer to that is in client keys. So all client requests and open payments are signed using a unique key that identifies the client to the authorization and resource servers. A client must generate and add its key to this registry before requesting a grant for the first time. And each client is represented by its own wallet address. So as a client signs up for a wallet address, there will probably be some basic KYC, like know your customer to make sure that they are who they say they are. Um, and this also allows us to bind that key to a specific domain to ensure that that uh, it's only valid for that specific client or service. Okay, so a key registry is a list of keys associated with client applications. They are publicly exposed endpoints so that servers can retrieve the client's key registry. And we've standardized that so that they can get there by accessing the wallet address slash jwks.json. And this allows servers to verify that the client is who they say they are. So we need to have another interlude here about what are asymmetric keys. So when you have a key pair generation, there are actually two keys that are generated. One of them is public, so anyone can have it, that's absolutely fine. And the other one is private. And this private key must never be shared under any circumstances. So the idea here is around encryption and decryption. So data that's encrypted with one key can only be decrypted with the other key. And since the private key is kept secret, it means that only the owner can encrypt or decrypt the data. In our case, the private key is used for encryption and the public key is used for decryption. So even though the public key is widely shared, the private key remains confidential. And this ensures integrity that the data cannot be tampered with, and it ensures authentication to confirm the identity of the sender. So how does it do that? Well, each client generates a key pair, a public one and a private one. And the public key is the key that becomes registered with the account servicing entity in that key registry. Because remember that key registry is a public endpoint, so only the public key can go to the public endpoint. And that private key is something that the client keeps itself and doesn't share with anyone. And the client then uses that private key to sign their requests. And now, since they have encrypted their requests with their private key, 
only the public key, which is in the key registry, can be used to decrypt those requests. So the account servicing entity is able to verify that signature using the client's public key that was already associated with them in the key registry. This ensures that the request is from the legitimate client and hasn't been tampered with. So obviously there is a secure process in place to set up that relationship between the public key and the client that requires a secure communication channel between the client and the AAC during the setup process. The advantage of using asymmetric keys is non-repudiation, which means that the client cannot deny sending the request, but it also provides guarantees about integrity and authenticity. Just to note, we're not talking about privacy here. So it's easy to think, oh, I heard of something about encryption and decryption. So I'm sure that's to make sure that, you know, no one else can kind of intercept these messages. That's actually not what we're talking about here, because remember that public key is what's used to decrypt these messages and it's public, so anyone can have it. What's the purpose of these asymmetric keys in this instance is to simply say, if I can decrypt it with this public key, and I know that this public key belongs to a specific client, then I know that this client must have made that request because it could only have been encrypted with their private key. And if I can decrypt it successfully, it also means that that data is still intact. Otherwise, something funky would happen when I try and decrypt it if it's been messed with. Okay. So we also need to understand a little bit about digital signatures. Um, so, you know, there's always two sides of this, which is kind of the client side about creating the signature and the server side about verifying the signature. So we're going to start on the client side and basically the signature, just think of it as some kind of algorithm that requires some inputs and the inputs that we are putting in here are the request data. So that's what we are sending across if that is a request to make an incoming payment, for instance, and then the input also includes the client's private key. And then the request data is hashed, which means it's converted into a fixed size string. The hash is encrypted with that client's private key and that creates the signature. So the output here is the signature, which is a unique encrypted string. Okay, so then on the server side, when it comes time to verify the signature, it will also receive certain inputs. It will receive the request data. It will receive the signature that was made as part of, it was included in the request, and it will receive the client's public key. And then the server hashes the received request data. It decrypts the signature using the client's public key to get the original hash. And of course, this is because it does not have access to the client's private key. And then the server compares both hashes. So if they both match, it means that the signature is valid. Okay, our last interlude, I believe, is just a, a brief uh, explanation of HTTP requests. So an HTTP request is a message sent by a client to a server. In our case, either the uh, authorization server or the resource server to request data to perform an action. All right, so in HTTP, you basically have a header and a body, and the header is containing metadata about the request or response. It provides essential information like content type, status codes, authentication credentials, and so on. And then the body contains the actual data that's being sent. So that might be a request or it might also be a response. And it also can contain uh, content, right? So form data, JSON payload, or HTML. If that sounded a bit confusing, don't worry about it too much. The basic idea is you can think of something like uh, sending a letter and the HTTP header would basically be the envelope with the instructions and the address and the body would be the letter inside with the main message. So when clients are sending 
requests to either the authorization server or the resource server, they are sending these HTTP requests, which means that their requests have a header component and they have a body component. So because we are using REST, it means that the client is making a couple of these requests and it's important that they have a consistent way to identify themselves across these requests to the authentication server. So clients must include the following in their header. They need all the input that was required to make that secure signature. Um, so that includes like the key ID that's associated with the client's key pair. Um, they obviously have to include that signature as well. And then in their body, they can also include a client property which contains their wallet address. Um, you know, when a client is making a request to the resource server, it would also have an authorization header, uh, which is the GNAP token header, and that would be what contains the access token. Okay, so what makes GNAP a good fit? Um, it gives end users or customers fine-grained control over what resources they're granting access to. So are they giving this third-party access to do incoming payments, quotes, outcoming pay outgoing payments? What kinds of access are they granting? Is it read access, write access, update or delete? And how often are they granting this access? Is it once off, repeated, monthly, weekly, whatever the case may be? And finally, just to zoom out one last time and take a look at the bigger picture again, Interledger is about sending instructions, not sending money, okay? The Interledger protocol suite gives us standardization, lowering transaction costs, a scalable solution, the potential to revolutionize payment experiences and enable really cool use cases like microtransactions. So open payments sits on top of this ILP protocol suite and gives us an easy way for third parties to get direct access to customers' accounts. So the best way I can summarize all of this is that the open payments layer is there and um, it sort of acts as the point where people make a decision that they want to make a transfer. And then the Interledger protocol is used to send instructions for that payment to happen. And then there are these account servicing entities at the bottom that are responsible for actually settling those funds between each other on pre-existing payment rails, which is where the money actually moves around. Okay, we made it to the end. I hope that was enlightening. <laughs>